Hello, I'm Dr. Georgia Ede, a psychiatrist specializing in nutritional and metabolic psychiatry. The exciting new field of metabolic psychiatry is changing not only the way we think about and treat mental illnesses, but also the way we feel about them. The term metabolic psychiatry was coined by Dr. Shabani Sethi, a psychiatrist, obesity medicine specialist, and clinical researcher who founded the Metabolic Psychiatry Clinic at Stanford University. In her words, Metabolic psychiatry is a new subspecialty focused on targeting and treating metabolic dysfunction to improve mental health outcomes. So before we take a closer look at the science of ketogenic diets for mental health, let's stop and consider what is the definition of a ketogenic diet. My definition anyway, is that a ketogenic diet is any way of eating that lowers insulin levels enough to turn on fat burning, and generate clinically meaningful levels of ketones in the blood. Most experts agree that clinically meaningful ketosis begins at serum beta-hydroxybutyrate levels of 0.5 millimole. A typical ketogenic diet is very low in carbohydrate, moderate in protein, and high in fat. Many people think of the ketogenic diet as a weight loss diet, but it was originally created to stabilize brain chemistry. It was originally created to treat people with seizures. The evidence behind the use of ketogenic diets for epilepsy is broad and deep. In addition to over a hundred years of clinical experience, there are animal studies, laboratory studies, and more than a dozen randomized controlled trials, which have consistently found that more than 50% of patients experience at least a 50% reduction in seizure activity on a ketogenic diet. So it's a very effective intervention. And there's emerging evidence for the use of ketogenic diets in other neurological conditions as well, as you can see on the left-hand side of this slide. The conditions in bold are the ones that have the most science behind them, including randomized controlled trials, which are considered the strongest type of evidence. And this robust evidence base in neurology is very good news for psychiatry, because I would argue that the line between neurology and psychiatry is imaginary. The brain is not divided into neurology cells and psychiatry cells. It is one organ. In fact, brain conditions considered neurological and brain conditions considered psychiatric share many common underlying features. And the four most important, the ones that we're gonna talk about uh, today are imbalances in neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, glutamate, and GABA, which psychiatric medications uh, are largely designed to target. Excessive inflammation and oxidative stress, which, and insulin resistance. We'll go into more detail about each one of these shortly, but I wanted to first introduce them together on one slide because it just so happens that high blood sugar and high insulin levels can lead to every single one of these underlying biochemical derangements. And while there certainly can be other causes, I would argue that high glucose and high insulin levels are by far not only the most common drivers of these brain damaging forces, but also the easiest to target with lifestyle changes. Because just as high sugar, high insulin diets can lead to all of these problems, the ketogenic diet has been shown in scientific studies to address all of these problems. So let's explore these major mechanisms in a little more detail. Uh, let's begin with insulin resistance. So diets too high in carbohydrate, especially refined carbohydrates, such as flour, sugar, juices, and cereals, require large amounts of insulin. And when insulin levels run too high too often, the ability for cells to respond to insulin's messages becomes impaired, and that's what's called insulin resistance. Insulin resistance has reached epidemic proportions around the world. So for example, here in the United States, depending on which study you look at and depending on your definition of insulin resistance, anywhere between 52% and 88% of us have insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is sometimes referred to as prediabetes because over time, it can eventually lead to high blood glucose levels and type two diabetes in susceptible individuals. But how does insulin resistance affect the brain? Glucose crosses the blood-brain barrier easily without any help from insulin. So the higher the blood sugar, the higher the brain sugar. 
This is true even in people with insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. So even people with severe metabolic dysfunction don't need to worry about low brain glucose. What people with insulin resistance need to worry about is low brain insulin. Because unfortunately, in people with insulin resistance, which again is now the growing majority of us, chronic overexposure to insulin at the blood-brain barrier causes insulin resistance of the receptors, the insulin receptors uh, that sit on the blood-brain barrier and that are responsible for escorting insulin into the brain. So as a person becomes more and more insulin resistant, it becomes increasingly difficult for insulin to cross into the brain. This means that paradoxically over time, the higher the blood insulin, the lower the brain insulin. This is a huge problem because brain cells cannot process glucose and turn it into energy or use glucose for anything else for that matter without adequate insulin. So in people with insulin resistance, the brain can be swimming in a sea of glucose and still be starving to death. And that dire predicament is what is called cerebral glucose hypometabolism simply sluggish brain glucose processing. There are now multiple lines of high quality evidence making a compelling case that this fundamental brain energy crisis is the driving force behind most cases of Alzheimer's disease. We now know that Alzheimer's disease is preceded by decades of gradually slowing brain glucose processing. PET scan evidence of cerebral glucose hypometabolism has been documented in women as young as in their early 20s. Insulin resistance was recognized as a key causal factor in Alzheimer's disease as long ago as 2008, leading researchers at Brown University, uh, led by Dr. Suzanne de Lamont, to begin calling Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes. We're still learning about how this common problem of sluggish glucose processing influences neuropsychiatric conditions other than Alzheimer's disease, but it stands to reason that a shortage of brain energy could cause all kinds of problems for mood, behavior, and cognition. And in fact, imaging studies do find evidence of brain glucose processing problems in autism, major depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. We now know that insulin resistance is also associated with all of the mental health conditions on this slide, which means that people with these conditions are more likely to have insulin resistance than people without these conditions. There isn't enough evidence yet to know whether insulin resistance alone can cause these conditions, but we are beginning to see that the presence of insulin resistance can make certain psychiatric problems worse, and then addressing that insulin resistance can improve those psychiatric symptoms. For example, Nova Scotia-based metabolic psychiatrist, Dr. Cynthia Kalkin's research has found that people with bipolar disorder who also have insulin resistance or type two diabetes, which is simply severe end-stage insulin resistance, are more likely to experience rapid mood cycling, more likely to suffer a deteriorating disease course and less likely to respond to the mood stabilizing drug lithium. Recently, her group published a very important study demonstrating that if you can reverse insulin resistance, in this case, she used the insulin sensitizing medicine metformin, a generic medicine commonly used to treat type two diabetes. Metformin is a, a drug that works by improving insulin resistance. If you can reverse insulin resistance with metformin, you can make a significant difference in the severity of bipolar depression symptoms.